Hi everyone. In this module so far, you've learned how to organize and how to protect your data. In this video, I want to focus specifically on how to share your data with the world at large. So we'll talk about open data, why it's important and how you can do it. Now, let's start by saying that your research findings without data underpinning them are really just claims. You need to be able to share the reasons why you've come to your conclusions in order for them to be believable. And there are lots of other benefits to sharing data too. Uh, the ones on the green side here are for society at large. Improved improve reproducibility is an important one. Um, we know that sometimes results are not reproducible. So it's important that the data is available so that other researchers can um, check them and run them again and make sure that they are robust. But also there might be whole new findings derived from data. Somebody might come up with a whole new question that they can answer with your data, or they might combine your data with other data sets and, um, and answer broader questions. There are also cases when uh, there is social or commercial value that you as a researcher might not be interested in pursuing, but others might be, and it's good to release that. By the way, if you are interested in protecting the commercial value of your data, there are ways to do that, and I'll talk more about them later. And data can be used as an educational resource, when I was starting my PhD, one of the first thing I did was look for a data set that was similar to mine and try to replicate the same analysis, to see if I could get the results uh, that were published. I've also used shared data sets uh, in my own teaching with students all the way from sixth form to PhD students. The other half of the wheel here is benefits for you as a researcher. First of all, you'll be more credible. Your reputation will benefit from the fact that you are open about the way you work and you're not afraid of scrutiny. There's also benefit in terms of more visibility. Your profile will be raised and data sets are citable in their own rights so they can help your citations and perhaps your career in the long term. You might also find that you can discover new collaborators who see your data, they're interested and get in touch with you. And lastly, it will enable you to comply with funder requirements. Many funders now, including the UK research councils, demand that researchers share their data. You need to make sure you respect this because otherwise you might find that your funding is compromised in the future. I will include under this video a link uh, to where you can find out about funder policies to check what applies to you. So you've decided to share your data, you know why. You will probably put it in a repository. A repository is a digital space dedicated to the long-term preservation of research outputs. So data, but also often articles and so on. Uh, repositories will give your data a digital object identifier, which makes it uh, traceable, findable, and also citable. They will also include metadata, so information about your data set, like um, where and why it was collected, what it contains, which is machine readable. And that means that automated processes, including the search engines, can find that data and people can discover it. Usually, if data is in a repository, anyone with an internet connection will be able to download it straight away. Although some repository enable you to do things a bit differently, perhaps putting the metadata out openly available online, but asking people to request the data set from you. This is an option if you have sensitive data or other data you can't share, but it's preferable as a default for data to be free to download for anyone. Um, there might be a repository that's specific to your discipline, which you know about. For instance, I was working in genetics and Gene Bank was a common one and there were lots of others. Um, your colleagues might know of one if you don't directly. If you're still not sure, you can try searching read3data.org, which is um, a list of all the repositories available. And that would really be your first option. If there is a subject specific repository for your data, then that's the best way to put it. And if there isn't one, uh, then go for an institutional repository. If you're at Cambridge, that would be Apollo, which is managed by us at the Office of Scholarly Communication. And, and we can also help you check and upload your data and so on. And um, if you are not associated with Cambridge or another institution with a repository, then you can use general purpose ones like Dryad, Zenodo, Figshare or others, um, which will do a similar job. They enable you to put your data online. There is sometimes the option to include data as supplementary information in a journal article. We don't tend to recommend that, at least not as the only way of sharing data, because there aren't quite the same guarantees on long-term preservation and discoverability. You should bear in mind the cost of sharing data in a repository. Uh, in the case of Apollo here at Cambridge, 
uh, data sets of less than 20 gigabytes are coded for free, but anything above that has a one-off charge of four pounds per gigabyte. And check with another repository if you choose to use a different one, what their costing is. And at the start of a project, you really should be planning all this. So you should be able to estimate roughly the size of the data set you'll generate and therefore the cost that you will incur. If you are applying for a grant, you can usually budget that in um, and you shouldn't be out of pocket for it. Now, not only do you need to put your data in a repository, but surely in doing so, you hope people will use it. So you need to give them the information they will need in order to be able to use it. And that means describing your data. You should always include a readme file in plain text format that has information like um, the contact details for the people who collected the data, uh, the reason why the data was collected and where and when and how. Um, the information and methods in a paper is usually not quite enough for somebody who wants to reuse that data. So try to give as much detail as possible. You'll also need information about uh, the data sets themselves, like uh, what units did you use, any abbreviations in the column headings and so on. And, and if there are publications related to it or code, then give links to those so people can cross-reference. Also, if there's more than one file in your data set, try to explain how they relate to each other. For instance, you might have a spreadsheet with a list of a set of interviews and then individual transcripts for each interview. Try to explain that. Now, I mentioned code, that's a really important point. A lot of us have been trained to modify and analyze data using programs like Excel, or maybe statistical packages like SPSS, Minitab, and so on. Now, those are great and they're very user friendly, but what can be difficult is tracing the process that you go through in modifying your data, like taking averages, adjusting for certain values, and then exactly what statistical test you conducted. That's all uh, reduced if you use a coding language such as R to analyze your data and automate the whole process. In that case, somebody could download your data set and the code you used and immediately replicate your analysis. It's also important as you write the code to annotate it, explaining exactly why you chose to do each step and, and what it represents. Now, I know that coding is a specific skill and you might need a bit of training on this, but it is available. Under this video, we'll include a blog that has just a few practical, easy pointers of where you can get started. But also there are lots of MOOCs, massive online open courses on reproducible coding and coding for statistical analysis, which you can find on MOOC platforms. If you're in Cambridge, there's also excellent training from the Bioinformatics Training Facility, uh, which is continuing online, at least to some extent, during the coronavirus um, problem that we're having. So, Try and look for that training. It is a really helpful skill that will uh, serve you well throughout a research career and beyond. The last thing you need to include with your data is a license. If you want to know lots more about licenses, then have a look at the module on copyright and licenses as part of this course. For now, let me just say that a license lets you retain the copyright to the data, but it tells anybody who finds the data what they can and can't do with it. So you might put a very open license where they can do whatever they want with it, or you might set conditions such as someone can reuse the data as long as they credit you as the author or as long as they don't make any um, profit from the use of the data and so on. Here are some examples. The Creative Commons license is a very uh, commonly used one. Uh, the other three, GNU, Apache and MIT licenses are software licenses. So they are similar in many ways, but they will include um, clauses that are specific to software such as and people have to report bugs if they find them and so on. So if you're interested in licensing, as I said, look at the resources on the other module and get in touch if you'd like a bit of advice on these. So why would you do all this? You'd want to share your data. Will it be used? Well, it is. We get millions of downloads for data sets in Apollo every year because first of all, you might cite the data in your paper. It's great if you can share the data just before publication and include a link in the manuscript itself. You might also communicate on this on social media and other ways and promote your data set. But also, as I said, data sets will be indexed by Google, so people might discover them serendipity serendipitously in their own searches. Based on that, they will download it, they will cite it, and you can get statistics for all that, either on the repository itself or using things like Google Scholar. You can use those for your own recognition. 
um, particularly now that more and more institutions are signing the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment, which Cambridge signed last year, um, that means they are committing to recognizing outputs like data sets that go beyond articles or books in decisions about promotion and appointment for research careers. So the value of a researcher is partly recognized in how they create data sets that have been useful to other people. Perhaps most importantly though, there will be new discoveries. Other people will find your data sets, they will come up with questions that you might never have dreamed of and that will drive the research process forward faster and faster and it will improve the knowledge of the whole of mankind. So you've only got one more thing to do. As you saw throughout the module, it's important to start planning this really early. So have a look at the next section on data management plans to pull this all together and see how you might do this in the, in the long term. Um, and I hope you can join us next week for the brand new module on searching the literature. Bye bye.